recording? There we go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Editing 101 panel. It's the last panel of the 101 series. But before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we, the WGA, is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for the diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nishinabe, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. I would like to acknowledge the help of Jason Norman with today's event. Thank you, Jason, so much. Today is the last, as I said, one on one series panel of the year. Uh, please do let us know if you enjoy the series uh, via our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can also subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel under the Writers Guild of Alberta name to watch each panel of this series and other programming videos that we have. Today, as I said before, we're going to chat about all things editing. So notice, first of all, this is not a workshop. This is just a conversation amongst friends of the ins and outs of editing. We are very fortunate today to have our three panelists. Um, we're going to be making the introductions and saying hi to everyone. So Kimi Beach, her sixth book, Noela, a fable, was shortlisted for the Georgia uh, Bunyet Award for Fiction in 2018. You can visit her at kimibeachediting.com. Hi, Kimi, how are you? Hi, Luciana, good, how are you? Good, thank you. Good. I wanted to also acknowledge that I'm on the border of Treaty 6 and 7. So wanted to acknowledge uh, the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, Nakota, Nakota and uh, also Inuit and Métis cultures from my area. Thank you so much, Kimi. And uh, next in our panel is Alicia Chantal. She is the owner of Fresh Look Editing based in Edmonton, Alberta. She specializes in nonfiction copy editing, uh, proofreading and writing, and is passionate about helping writers create messages that educate and empower. Alicia was a member of Editors Canada Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, and also served as co-coordinator of her local chapter. When not at her desk, she can be found spending time with her husband and three boys reading or watching a good show. Hi, Alicia, how are you? Hi, thanks, Lucien. I'm good. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here tonight. Thank it's you. very official. <laughs> <laughs> but he, and here's Peter, Peter Bisley. <laughs> he doesn't really need introductions, but we'll introduce him nonetheless. He's a poet and storyteller born in South Africa, based in Edmonton. He has performed in several countries around the world and has published three children's books, one of which, Tuli's Mattress, won the International Board of Books for Young People Award for Literacy Promotion and has been translated into 27 languages. His latest poetry collection, Let Us Not Think of Them as Barbarians, was released in 2019 by New West Press. Hi, Peter. Hello, thank you all for waiting so patiently for me. I. I got the time wrong. I was all good <laughs> to be here at seven, but well, thank you all for calling me and here I am. So. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, so let's dig in with the questions that, uh, and conversation. Uh, of course, we are friends and we've chatted about this before. So in a bit, in, we're just going to refresh our memories with all these um, you know, tips on editing and whatnot. First of all, I want to ask you, what is editing to you and what area of the wide field of editing you focus on? I don't know who wants to go first. Would like to. Uh, I'll go first, if you like. Okay, yeah, I have you right next to my screen. So perfect, okay. thanks, Kimi. So what is editing to me is finding the snapshot. So what is the book about? And then convincing the author that it's too long Mm -hmm. and holding the flashlight <laughs> as they go into the dark tunnel. So I don't see my role as, um, I don't see editing as a, so much a, a transformation of the text, but rather a focusing. So I always liken it to a dark tunnel and you shine a flashlight and the author goes, goes down there by themselves. You're just shining the light on it. 
Wow, that's an amazing definition. I, I, I work with you and I know exactly what you mean. And you're a bit of a sorceress when it comes to editing, I must oh, say. Thank you. <laughs> In the best way possible, <laughs> shining every single light on, on every word and, and then hiding behind. And it's like, yep. how did she do it? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. Alicia, what do you see as your job as an editor? Um, for me, editing has always been such a collaborative exercise at its heart. I really think that being able to work with an author, um, no matter what level of experience they have, is really about getting to know them, getting to know their voice, and doing everything I can to amplify that voice and bring that out. So not to overshadow, but to step back and let my client, the author, ultimately shine in whatever that is. Because um, as Luciana mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm primarily a nonfiction specialist. So whether that's business books or a, a, an annual report or whatever the case might be, um, I think that that's, that's a tenet I always try to take and weave through everything that I, that I do. Because it, it ultimately is not my work. It's my job to amplify someone else's work. So that's what it's always meant to me. It takes a lot of generosity, I find, then to be an editor and put yourself in the in the back seat and let the text shine. It's a it's a major task. Peter, what can you say about all that and what is editing for you? You know, I, I've been thinking about this since we last spoke, and I thought, you know, to put it succinctly, I'm a communication cowboy. Uh, <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, the all... stone cowboy. <laughs> Communication cowboy. It's, it's all about wrangling other people's words into a way, into a shape, the way any other cowpoke would work with a herd of cattle or an animal trainer would tame the wild things and wild meanings, make them obey. It's about massaging meanings and uh, ideas until they don't hurt. That's it's that's it. And and so I edit a lot of materials from academic work to creative writing. But I'm focusing mostly on creative writing right now. It, and I do poetry and developmental work. Yeah. So when you talk about wrangling those words and all that, um, and the question goes for all of you, how that, does your work bring into focus the interaction with publishers and authors? When you edit a book, do you interact mostly with publishers, mostly with authors? How does because you work on a text, but ultimately the text has been written and published by someone or that, that is requesting your services. So how, how does this whole relationship um, go? Can, can we say anything about that? Uh, type of maybe work. Peter, since you were oh. talking about <laughs> yeah. it earlier. Yeah, you can. I, you know, it really time. depends on who is, who's paying the bill, basically. As a freelancer, it's who's paying the bill. Who's employing me? If it's the author that's employing me, then my responsibility is to the author. Um, if it's the publisher, then obviously I am. I have to look at what the publisher wants me to do, but I'm also a go-between between between the publisher and the author. And I have to, I have to negotiate sometimes. It depends on what the author is asking or the publisher is asking me. Is work that relationship, and if there are disagreements then I have to negotiate. Alicia has said it, it's about communication and interpersonal relationships at that level. Mm -hmm. Alicia, you wanna expand on that a little bit more maybe? In particular, how do you work with the publishers and or authors? I, I agree with Peter, it really does depend. Well, there's definitely no one size fits all approach, I yeah. think, because you know, when you're working with a publisher, and in my experiences, I've I've often worked a little bit more arm's length with the author. Um, whereas, of course, when we're dealing with when I'm dealing with direct businesses or self-publishing <coughs> authors, of course, then I'm dealing directly with the clients that have actually written the piece that I'm working on. And so, I think, like Peter nails it, it's it is about managing relationships. And oftentimes, you know, I don't think ed sometimes people think of editing as as overall project management, but it really is. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways, um, because there's there's many facets to it. It's not just here's the piece, take it and fix the commas, make the spelling good, and then that's the end of it. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces, and I think for our clients, we owe it to them too to know about their business, about the publishing world, how it works, so we're able to try and kind of weave in and out of those um, 
relationships as best we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kimi? I've had um, projects where the managing editor at the press has said, don't do anything but move commas. Don't, don't say anything substantive. <laughs> you will get pushback. You do not fight with this author. She's right 100% of the time. You are wrong. Okay. So then I do a mechanical copy edit and I, I gloss over everything that I can see substantially that's wrong with it. But when I work one on one with, with uh, private clients, that's a totally different relationship. You, you, you build the trust there and you, you have a personal relationship with them, which ends usually at the end of the, of the time. But uh, I do what I'm told by the press if I'm working for a press. Just do a mechanical copy edit. Do not say anything about story or structure or anything. Just move the commas around. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm happy to do that. But I, I like working with authors better. I really do. I like the one on one. And that's mostly what I get. Those are great answers, guys. Thank you for illuminating that as well. So, you know, you've been editing for some time, but there is the moment where you decide you become an editor. Like, like is an editor born or an editor made? When did you say, hey, I am an editor here, world? Just, you know, hire me and I'm ready to, to enjoy your words. And when did that moment took place for you, Kimi? It was in uh, about 2014 and I was standing in Barry Dempster's kitchen in Ontario. And I said, you know, I, I've read a few books for free and I've offered my services and said, I'll, I'll look at this for you for nothing. Um, and and I did that three times. All of those books went on to be published and were awarded. And I'm standing in his kitchen he, and I'm saying to him, I want to do this for a living. And he said, what's stopping you? And I said, me. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. And then Peter, um, Peter noticed what I was doing. I built a bit of a portfolio based on those free edits I had done. And he hired me to do uh, an evaluation on a memoir. And based on that, he hired me to do the substantive edit when he was at uh, the University of Alberta Press. And so uh, once I cracked that, thanks to him, um, I've been working for them solid for 10 years now. So the, it was kind of a progression, but it was the, the main thing was me saying, get off your ass, Beach. <laughs> Tell some authors that you want to look at their books for free. And then, you know, you put it on your portfolio. You don't have to say it was for free. You just say, oh, it won this award or this award. And now you've got like five books on your portfolio. And authors notice that and editors notice that. So I, that's the best way I can describe it is just throw caution to the wind and, get, and, and go, what the hell? Yes. Alicia, for you, when was the moment? Thanks, Kimi. Oh. Ooh, back in the early 2000s, when I was a mere slip of a girl, um, <laughs> I, wa I wanted to, um, to actually be a journalist. And when I started working mm -hmm. at my university's newspaper, um, I went to university in Lethbridge, I um, found myself interested in the copy editor position. And I had an absolutely, I, I'm telling you guys this, it was an absolutely god awful interview. It was a panel interview with all of the current staff of the newspaper interviewing the candidate <laughs> that wanted the individual. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, and nobody wanted to be copy editor because everybody else wanted the sexier jobs. They wanted the stuff in front of the camera, so to speak. They wanted the production manager, the ad manager, all that kind of stuff. And they had actually asked me like, well, how do you know you've done a good job when you're editing? And um, I remember very clearly saying, I know I've done a good job when nobody knows what it is that I do. Because yeah. to me, I, I found I like that behind the scenes work. I didn't want to be the person in front. I wanted to be <clears throat> a supporter. Um, because honestly, I mean, I'm sure all of us here being in communications in various forms, like you read a newspaper, if it's well edited, well written, nobody asks, who wrote that? Who the heck is the copy editor that did this piece? But if it's not well done, <laughs> right, right, everybody now is looking 
for the bylines. Oh, look. Gotcha. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, folks. Hey, so, say hi. 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 Look yeah, at all yeah. these people waving at you. Oh. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Never be sorry for a guest. No, oh, never. Hi, Thatcher. <laughs> Our okay. fourth panelist. I forgot to mention him. I'm so sorry. What can you tell us about having a granddad for an editor? <laughs> <laughs> or an editor for a granddad. <laughs> no, I'm not taking them off. But I tell you what, why don't you go back to? Why don't you go back? To, oh. Bye, Thatcher. Bye. Bye, bye. Ooh, love you. <laughs> this, this is this is my daily interruption. <laughs> Sorry, oh, folks. Wonderful. I just hijacked the show there. Oh, Thatcher. You're welcome. <laughs> That's wonderful. Fine. Uh, so Alicia, this is great to to hear about your um you know your your realizing that you were an editor as you worked in the newspaper and everybody else wanted the glamour you know uh, jobs and you decided to go and do the the least uh, sexy one and Sorry. in the end and in the end just you know realizing that that was your 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 line of work and and your vocation that's great to to hear about um, you see as editors though we get the most marvelous assistants right hmm. the exactly. most marvelous <laughs> assistants so that's pretty so, awesome yeah <laughs> uh, what about you peter what made you realize you were an editor um you know i've I basically just walked into a publisher without actually really knowing what an editor is or does, to be honest. Um, walked into a publisher's office and said to, to her, I'm an editor, have you got work for me? And uh, she smiled and gave me some manuscripts to look at. And slowly the, it developed from there at a the point, and that was around 1988, 89. And she gave me evaluations and gradually got me trained up with, uh, with one of the leading editors in South Africa and gave me more work. And I, yeah, it just grew from there. But it's not, it's not a method I would recommend for everybody and not one that would normally work. But yeah, I just, but that's me, you know, face north and you can whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, facing so. north. Yeah, yeah. So, um, in 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 your case, well, you've been mentored, and you know, throughout your your career, I'm sure. Would you like to speak of of your mentors, and then after that, how do you mentor other editors? <clears throat> so it's like a double, you know, sided question here. Who were your mentors? You are here now, and how do you mentor as an editor? My, my mentors were, first of all, Teresa Parpenfuss at the publisher where I was working. And she, she was the one who literally gave me the manuscripts as a complete newbie, said to me, read, obviously saw that I had an eye for something um, and slowly said, all right, so do this. And then gave me advice to say, so why did you pick this one? Why did you do that? Start thinking about why you are making certain choices. And then... She took me to Francis Galloway, who is who started one of the very first publishing training programs at the university and who was working at a next door publisher. And together, the two of them would literally sit down with the manuscript and say, why did you make this change? What is the purpose of that change? If you make that change, look how it affects that and walked me step by step through through what I was doing. So. It was very, very hands-on, and I, I still think that editing is a lot of that. Courses are great. You should do them to get the, get the training, but you need that mentor who's going to stay, sit there with you and walk you through a thing or to answer a difficult question. I still do this with, uh, with other editors. We call each other and we talk to each other, and I say, You've got a, we've got a, I've got a problem. Or they say to me, I've got a problem. How do I deal with this? And I give that advice freely. It, I'll do the same with writers. We give we give a lot of advice because, uh, and that is a form of mentorship um, to say, I've been doing this since 1988. So that's 30 plus, 35 years. 
I have the experience. It is time to, to hand a lot of that over to other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alicia, what about you in your case? Um, what can you tell us about your mentors and who you are, how you're mentoring? And... Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure um, <laughs> I can almost guarantee they're going to kill me for saying this, but um, in all honesty, um, I have what I'm very proud to say is a group of friends who are editors who I consider to be my mentors, um, starting with the wonderful Kimmy Beach, who is sitting on my right on the screen, um, <laughs> Tracy Anderson, Jessica Coles, Rhonda Chronic, and Lorna Stuber. And I kid you not, these women have been, were the first people to welcome me into the editing industry. Um, they helped me um, with uh, my co-coordinator duties in Editors Canada. They worked alongside me. They answered any questions I had um, because I've only owned my business officially for three years. So even though I've been in comms and, and different writing and editing pursuits for much longer than that, um, I've really a newbie, so to speak, than branching out on my own. So I credit those women, honestly, with, um, with being my mentors. And they are the ones that inspire me that when there's somebody I see coming along um, to be able to um, to be able to be open with my with my knowledge, what I do have, um, to be open to answering questions they have. And um, quite honestly, also for them to give me a good reality check when I've already said I have too much on my plate. But, you know, do I have a few more hours and always rest assured, Kimmy, now. <laughs> And Kimmy will, Kimmy will virtually sit me down and remind me that I still have to take care of myself. And so, um, yeah, without any word of a lie, what a wonderful community we have, mm -hmm. really. That's so great to hear. And that's, that's wonderful that friendships develop alongside mentorship. That's very important too, right, Kimi? Mm -hmm. um, One of the nicest moments of my life was when I first met Alicia at an event. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was fangirling on me in a way that I have never <laughs> been fangirled on. It was wonderful. And I was like, don't, no, I'm just a normal person. I'm glad that <laughs> I, but it was a beautiful, I'll never forget it. Um, and, and thank you very much for your acknowledgement of that. I feel the same way about that group. Um, I, my mentors were Robert Croach, um, Burke Sproxton, and um, Ted Dyke, and a few others. Burke died um, uh, 15 years ago or so now, and he was my mentor for 15 years. And when he died, I was like completely unmoored. Like, where's the guy in front of me with the machete knocking down the 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 underbrush to, in front of me. So I know what the heck I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I told a friend this shortly after he died. And the friend said to me, you know, okay, now you turn around because you're in front. You turn around now and you see who's following you. And that day I decided that what he was doing, what Burke was doing was grooming me to be a mentor. And he had done that. And so I, I took it on from, from that point and I've never forgotten how important mentors are. And although I do say no sometimes to people I don't know who want me to answer 9 million questions, when people like Alicia come along, I just, I, I, I feel like that's what I'm meant to be doing. And um, I would be totally remiss and you can kill me later, Midgley, but Peter has been one of my, most solid mentors and teachers over the past 12 years. I don't, I, I don't know that I would be quite the elevated writer that I am now without him. So I can, and editor, I, there, I can't tell you how many times I text him a day and like, what am I supposed to do with this stupid author? And he'll say, <laughs> do this. Now, what about my stupid author? So we, we have this back and forth. So there's, I can't put a value on mentorship. I, I, I can't, it's, it's totally integral to what we do. But I, I want to add to that, that the mentorship doesn't just stay within the editing community, it's with the entire writing community. Yes. There, are, there are, we all gain bits and pieces of knowledge that we 
that we can share and that we that we can do is, you know, if I'm negotiating a contract and somebody says to me, I want you to delete this clause. And I say, wait, no, stop. Think about it. This is what this clause does. Do you really want to do that? Um, yes, it's legal advice. And, and I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give you official legal advice. But I can say to you from my experience, here's advice. You can take it or leave it. Um, or most importantly, if you're concerned, speak to a lawyer. These contracts are important. So make sure you've got the knowledge and think, read it and think about it. That is a form of mentorship, for instance, or I see it as a form of mentorship because authors need to be aware of their, their rights and obligations in terms of a contract, in terms of copyright, in terms of all of these things. And if I have knowledge that I can share in these areas, I should do so or point people to those who can give them the advice they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, now, it's great to hear about mentorship and Alicia, I want to start with you with this next question because you were saying that Kimi was instrumental in telling you or the group of, of women editors, colleagues of yours, mentors that you called, um, they will tell you, when is it okay to step down or to you know take a breather or take care of yourself? So um, I know that the three of you blog about editing and writing. Um, so I want to touch base on you uh, with you on 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 which other extracurriculars uh, have helped you, um, you know, put your your work into context. So you guys are bloggers and you blog sometimes, but I want to ask Alicia also not just about her blog, which I really want you to 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 you know to talk about, but also the Stead Walk. <laughs> Stead. I just want to see what other you know things you do for self-care as an editor and how important it was for you, Stead Walk. Oh my goodness. So what Lucian is referring to, if any of you are on Twitter or Instagram, um, there's a hashtag StetWalk um, where it was started by two editors in the US, um, I believe in 2019, um, as a way of encouraging each other to get up and get away from the computer and, thanks Peter, and to, um, thanks, Peter. to stand to go out, walk, and then basically share what we see when we're out on a walk, um, just to take pictures and post them. And that has been so fantastic for me, especially as we've gone through these last two years of pandemic life, because I it got to a point where I, I had to physically get out of my house and, and look around, um, see inspiration outside of the walls of my home. And um, being able to do that is not only good for my physical and mental health. Um, last year, I was proud to say I walked every day in 2021. And so far I've walked every day in 2022. Um, even if it's just to, you know, down the road to the fire hydrant and back, that counts. That's still outside and it counts. Um, and it's it's been so good because not only has it, you know, expanded that community for me, but it's, again, like I say, it, it's easy and you all as writers will know what I'm talking about, it's so easy to get right in our heads with what we do. And I think just being able to do something as simple as breathing the fresh air really helps. Um, as for the blog that you mentioned, um, I do a blog I call the Fresh Look Editing Five. So every month I just give five tips on something, some aspect of editing, freelancing or whatnot. And um, for me, I find that that has kept me very humble. <laughs> As an editor, too, and knowing that, A, I can't do everything all the time because there have been some months that my blog have been mm, more consistent mm -hmm. than others, mm -hmm. <laughs> we say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but it's also kept me very humble because, again, to think that people that do this for a living um, is putting a piece of yourself out there no matter what it is that you're writing. And I think that that is, that is really huge, no matter what it is that you're writing on a public forum. Um, and it reminds me that when I'm taking a work to edit, um, that I'm essentially in some ways taking someone's baby into my hands. So not to smoosh the baby, but to <laughs> <laughs> try to nurture it and help it thrive. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, Peter, you want to say something about your blogging or what extracurriculars you do for your, uh, besides your editing and your literary work, 
what other things. Uh, the reason why I'm asking is because when we first discussed this early, the three of us, the four of us, um, we were saying we are more than talking heads. And off came the song Burning Down the House, the whole thing. So anyway, Peter, uh, <laughs> without pointing fingers at you, <laughs> maybe building up the house. Do you want to say something? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think she's hinting at the fact that I have a constant renovation project since the, <laughs> my, my roof caved in from snow damage. Uh, and I had snow damage throughout the house. We have been in a constant rebuild, but uh, but you know, editing is rebuilding anyway. So I don't see it as particularly different. I I'm a person of limited interests. I read books. I write books. I edit books. Um, most of what I do involves books in some form or another. And of course, yes, I like to get out and and do walks, go for do exercise and that. But when I write, I, I enjoy talking about editing. I enjoy reading about various aspects of editing, of writing. And I try to think very deeply about the crafts I do and find ways to, to demystify this for, for people who aren't in editing. We don't just wave a wand and the words shape and fall into place automatically. There are, we work hard at what we do and it helps to be to help people understand. Um, I I've compared it to to designing a motor racing car, for instance. So I try and look at various ways to to explain what we do as editors um, in accessible ways and in ways that audiences that don't generally work with books can understand. Um, you know, I, the motor racing one came because I was speaking to to my um, to a mechanic at a, at a garage, and he said, "What do editors do?" And the minute I could speak to him about Formula One racing, he went, "Oh yeah, I get it. Gee, that's actually important." <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so it's it's uh, like to think about that and find different ways to to be on panels like this. This is that's what I enjoy doing beyond beyond physical editing is is actually talking about my work and the significance of it. I also edit places like the Read Alberta website where, yes, where I can congrats talk. on that. <laughs> Thank you. No, but it's important work. It's it's of about course, promoting not just authors but our local publishers. We if we don't start locally, where do we start? Uh, yeah, it begins here. So yeah. just to try and be involved as much as possible behind the scenes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Kimi, you also blog. So if you want to talk about your blogging, our uh, and, and also like Alicia, if you have any other activities that keep you sane, you know, amongst yeah. your work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and thank you for not mentioning that I've not blogged for months. I haven't uh, either. And I haven't blogged. Don't worry. We are all doing that. <laughs> I blame pandemic brain for that. But yeah. My blog is aimed at um, beginning writers, so I'm very gentle and I'm and I give like a tip. But one of the things that I do is I I try to read as widely as I can, um, so that when I'm working with a, a new author, I can say, oh well, you might want to read this book because it's doing something similar to what you're doing, and you for a couple of reasons you want to make sure you're not that book if you've already read it which is a bit of a danger when you're starting out and also that it's different enough from things that that are already out there that if you read enough in the area that you're writing in you can make sure that you're not repeating it so uh my blog is is a lot about that but the main things that i do to keep um that non-writing or non uh editing stuff is for two decades, I've been getting through, getting my nieces and nephews and now my great nieces and nephews on both sides of my family to figure out what Hamlet is mumbling about. So when they get to grade 12, they're like, oh, mom, I don't know what to be or to be, not to be means. They're like, just phone your Auntie Kimmy. Just phone. So that's- You're the Hamlet hotline. 
I'm the Romeo and Juliet Macbeth and Hamlet hotline. Just I'll tell you, give me a call. But the thing is, I don't tell them. I ask them questions and they figure it out for themselves. But that's been a very important part of my life. And I have a two person book club with my niece. And uh, we're reading an Ethiopian novel right now. It was shortlisted for the Booker Prize a couple of years ago. So we we expand each other's uh, reading because we we trade off Mm -hmm. what book we're going to read. So, I I mean, if I could read, that's all I would do. I I love walking. I love, um, you know, being outside. I love camping. So those things help me, too. But a lot of the times I'm editing while I'm camping. So I've got a book. Wow. You can edit anywhere is the beautiful thing about this job, everybody. <laughs> you just print it off and sit by the fire. But um, mainly it's mentoring younger generations. For me, that really takes me out of my own silly editing brain, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. And it, it goes directly into my next question, because as you as you talk about expanding reading, I'm thinking also about expanding editing. And I know that and what I want to to because we, we went through this uh, conversation before and I just want your your answers. And I mean, what whoever wants to jump at it first, but um, if it, there is a difference between the process of editing an English original work as opposed to a literary work translating to English, and on that line, how does editing a work by hyphen authors differ from editing work by native English speakers or writers, or if there is such a difference? And you know that the reason why I'm asking is because of, you know, the type of work that I that I do in my other job, right? So I felt that it was necessary to to perhaps you know, just have a tiny conversation about that as well. Anyway, take it away, guys. <laughs> I would be the first to admit that I don't do translation work. Um, I am absolutely in awe of those who do um, because I think it's 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 so important. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't say, I can't add anything to your, to the conversation here from the working standpoint, but just that I think it is, it is amazing and very important too, so that the folks that do it well, aren't losing the essence of what was originally intended. Um, Cause I think we know there's a lot of things that can be twisted <laughs> if they're not, mm-hmm. if they're not um, translated correctly. Okay. Peter. <laughs> Peter is the guy to talk to about this. Maybe, I, I, yeah. And, and also I want to preface this by saying that I love it when people, you know, you don't have to know about it. And this is what I talk about when I talk about expanding editing as well. You know, an editor is not someone who knows it all. And so it's good as friends to, to ask questions. And, you know, if we don't have the answers, we don't have the answers. It's perfectly acceptable. Yes, Peter. Um, well, I've... One of the things I've written about extensively is living among languages um, and and also editing. I edit in Afrikaans and I edit in English. So I I work in two languages and I'm I'm going to say that I don't know that there's anything, um, there's nothing different in the process. Uh, It's an extra layer, but there's no reason why I should treat anybody who's worked was originally in a different language any differently or with any less respect or anything else than I would any other author. I do what I do with every book is I take the work and the author seriously. And that's the starting point is, so on a basic level, there's no difference whether you're, there are hyphenations or not, take the work seriously um, it adds a different layer of discussion. You have to become aware of contexts. You have to become aware of voice matters. Uh, cultural reference points become very, very important. You have to become aware of those you aren't aware of. You have to remain aware of the ones you you know. You have to work just a little bit harder to be aware all the time. And if you're grown up in a culture, many of these cultural reference points are innate. When you are working with translation, even though you have fluency, mm-hmm. you don't always have cultural fluency. So, so you've 
just got to switch on a little bit extra and be aware of, of any of those reference points that, that may trigger it and ask questions. Mm -hmm. you, you, working with anybody across cultures or across languages, it's about learning. So ask and ask. People will tell you if you ask them. Yeah. And if anybody else wants to say something, just uh, feel free to jump in. Thank you, Peter. This is. Uh, I think you know. um, my experience, my only experience really has been with people who are writing in English, but for whom English is not their first language. For instance, your anthology that That's I right. where I felt that it was really important to make sure that I wasn't messing with the 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 tone or the meaning or the syntax even if it wasn't grammatically correct in english that doesn't matter they're they wanted to express it in a way that was uh true to their culture and i did my best to try to not mess mm -hmm. with that um and i've worked with a lot of um writers from uh africa nigeria and south africa mostly and i and i I do try very hard to to make sure I'm I'm accurate, and if I don't know, I just ask. I'm like, is this an idiom? I don't know it. Mm -hmm. um, just tell me, so because yeah. you know more than I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was thinking as I was asking the question. Um, sorry, that that's the way you worked with us, Kimi. And I, I, as Peter was talking about, I I recall like almost verbatim, the stages in our uh, book where you said, you know, this is part of the author's voice. I'm not going to tamper with that. I'm not going to touch that. And I felt it was such a good call as, you know, because I was also doing the line editing in the process. And I felt it was a great call also for me. Like I was learning as I went from right. Kimi's cues as well. So I, I love how that, that work came about. Thank but now you. I think, That's yes. Great. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. I, and I keep it very fresh in my mind at all times. Um, now, I think it's time for, for us to open the, the, the questions uh, to, to, to our audience, and which have been super kind uh, to be here. We have such good numbers today. I'm kind of floored, actually. Um, so there is one question already that has been passed down uh, through Jason from the public. So I'm going to just read it out. Um, can uh, you uh, three um, editors talk about what developmental edits, mechanical copy edit, and substantive edit mean, and maybe there are other types of edits. So take it away, you guys. It's uh, it's an editing one on one question, and I'm really glad that someone actually asked about the different types of edits. So if you want to give us a quick quick primer, <laughs> um, I'm going to actually point people very quickly to the Editors Canada website that has an entire brochure that sets these definitions up very, very clearly, and it is downloadable for free. So yes, we can talk about that, but please do visit Editors Canada and, um, and, do, and do download that document. It's, it's very useful. So, all right, sorry, my, there's my little piece. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would agree with Peter. The, the brochure is extremely useful and anybody, can understand it. Um, from a personal vantage point, uh, developmental editing is, could, could these 12 pages go because we don't really know what design the Kleenex box has to be on the kitchen table and the fact that the kitchen is, the kitchen table is in the kitchen? <laughs> Maybe we don't need to know that. I mostly do copy editing for presses. So it's stuff like, how do you spell Q-tips? And you can't quote four lines from the Beatles help without permission. So that's a level of, that's copy editing. So you get that kind of, um, mm -hmm. that kind of mechanical detail. But uh, again, I'm with Peter to check out their, the resources at EAC are wonderful. Um, if, are I could, wonderful. <laughs> if I could just come back to developmental editing. Yes, it's that bigger picture where we are moving entire chapters and entire chunks of text around to say, will this work better here? These ideas don't flow, move that, move this. Um, when you get down to copy editing, you're re and it's trying to find at developmental editing, the balance in the overall structure is everything flowing overall. 
then you narrow down a little bit to copy editing where you're looking at it at a paragraph level. Yeah. And saying, is this paragraph hanging together? Does it follow on the next paragraph? So now your focus has gone from those big overall foc focal things to smaller paragraph level. And then when you come to line editing, you are literally looking line by line, sentence mm -hmm. by sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at least, yes, at least, yeah, okay. yes. No, no, I, yeah, just um, I, I'm interested in, in, in what you have to say because you do a, a very specific type of editing. So please feel mm -hmm. free to, to expand on that. So I do copy editing and proofreading. Developmental editing is is really I'm trained in it, but it's not my not my forte. Um, so I'm I I always think very visually about it. For me, it's it's like an inverted pyramid, um, like Peter and Kimmy have, have um, already alluded to. When you're doing developmental editing, you're really looking at big picture things, and as you drill down into line editing or copy editing, then you're looking at the more as as Peter was saying, like paragraph by paragraph, line by line, um, you know, word by word. Um, and then when you get into proofreading, which is another area of, cop of editing that I do, um, I always think of that as the quality assurance level. So mm -hmm. once all the rest of that is done, like once your editing is finished, everything's in place, it's ready to print, the proofreaders are the ones that are gonna come in and make sure that pages one through 10 are actually numbered one through 10, as opposed to one, six, nine, 10, 12. <laughs> um, you're going to make sure, you know, make sure that um, the copy editor's um, uh, style guide is followed so that if you've spelled Luciana one way on page two, you're not spelling Luciana some other way on page three, if that was something that got missed. Because the thing is, is that when you're moving from, uh, from, I guess, you know, a Word or an Adobe document or whatever it might happen to be in when you're editing, sometimes through no fault of poor editing or anything or poor graphic design, things just shift, things move. Mm -hmm. So it's the last kind of line of defense before something gets sent to the printers to hopefully avoid any of those embarrassing typos. Yes. That we see. Um, I've had books, I'm sure we've all had books where sometimes you look and there's a chapter repeated <laughs> somewhere in the book, you know, and hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully the proofreader caught that before, or yeah. you need a new printer. It's one well, of the... <laughs> <laughs> Italo Calvino or, wrote an entire novel about that. Uh, if on a winter's night, a traveler. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so not only we can check editors.ca, but we can also check Italo Calvino and and read about that, which is mm -hmm. wonderful. So on that order, there is a second question coming. Um, what advice? And and I'm just reading straight through, so we can just you know. Yeah. What advice would you give for the top things to double check before submission? It's a very broad question. So I don't know who wants to answer this. Do we have another seminar planned? Final answer? <laughs> Have like another three hours because oh, oh dear dear <laughs> right um I, I think I can confidently say print the thing out read it out loud to your dog your plant whatever go through it many many times looking for just one thing this is what this is my um best advice is just look for adverbs that you don't need and then read it again and just look for extra spaces after after um, full stops. Read it again. Just look for, uh, uh, just pick a thing and look for that one thing. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take 20 or 30 hours to do this, but it's going to make such a different impression on whoever you're sending it to next. Mm -hmm. If they can see that you've actually done this work and done it methodically, not you're not reading it going, I'm going to catch every single thing I need to fix. It doesn't work that way. You, you read it and you look for one thing at a time. This is how I teach it. Mm -hmm. So you guys I, differ on that, but. No, I, I would agree with that. And I would also just say, bear in mind, you are the writer, not the designer of the book. 
you don't have to make the book look pretty and try and do 10 million kinds of styles. The first thing an in-house editor or any copy editor is going to do is strip all of that out again and start from scratch and tag it the way the publisher wants you to tag right. it. So yes, you want to use it, but be, be as minimalist as you can be in, in all of this. It's not your job to make the book look pretty. That's the design, book designer's job. So mm -hmm. keep it simple, spend your energy looking at more important things like mm -hmm. making sure your writing is actually good. <laughs> There's that. Yes. <laughs> Just sorry. Um, that. <laughs> I, I agree with what Kimmy and Peter have said, but I would also add one of the things that um, just even as a just as a citizen that means a lot to me is double checking names um, whether oh, it's a personal, yes. was a personal name a place name a building name whatever the case might be but especially when it comes to personal names because I think that um, the best advice I can give on that is don't guess do your best to find out um because mm -hmm. the thing is is that names are so powerful and are so personal yeah. and when people are careless especially if it might be from a, a language that is outside of their their own native tongue i think it goes a long way to show a great deal of respect when you make the effort to get it right um again and none of this means i mean obviously as, as writers, we're not asking for perfection because quite honestly too, we'd all be out of jobs if there was perfection on the first go. But I think that that's something that to me is, is very, very important um, to me personally. And I, I like to see when people have made the effort to do that because we can tell, we can tell as well when that's, when that's happened or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. This is I think these are very great answers and very good tips that we can all take to heart. Um, despite editors.ca, please check that site out and read Italo Calvino, please, if you're a writer <laughs> and if you're an editor. Um, and speaking of writers, I have one last question that I'm going to, to share uh, before we have to say our goodbyes. Um, and that is from Aisha Cloud, who said, how do you handle a sensitive or defensive author? How um, has that happened? Yes. Can, can I jump in there? Yeah. I think that it has to uh, do with your, your attributes as an editor. And, and you have to be very clear on what those are. And you have to be authentic about them and, and be willing to say them. And for me, I always start with, you're going to get kindness, gentleness, understanding, respect, fun, probably a lot of swearing, pour yourself a glass of wine before we have the video call, authenticity, so mm -hmm. that it puts their mind at ease. If they're resistant, it's because they've had an, a bad experience, likely, before. Mm -hmm. And they've had an, an editor who hasn't respected them. So if you can give a totally different impression, and I do that with video, um, it, it kind of makes them go, oh, not everybody's like that last thing I just had. So, but you have to be honest about it and go, this is really who you, you're really getting who I am. So if, if, if that helps. That's a super pearl of wisdom, Kimi. Thanks. Really, thank you. I appreciate this beautiful be, answer. <laughs> you gotta be who you are. Yes. Who else? <laughs> Alicia, have you got, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I think all I would, I would add to, to Kimmy's answer is that I think that it's important to, to do the legwork ahead of time to establish that relationship as best you can so that a writer knows what the expectations are that what we would expect of them and what they would expect of us. So one of the things um, that I've committed to asking my clients about was even something like, are there, is there anything you'd like to share with me that, um, that I should know as we go through the edit, um, not to be, not in a way of digging for personal information, but in a way of saying, you know, um, just very quickly, I, I've heard of, I had an, a colleague who talked about 
being very confused as to why one of their authors was acting the way they were and they thought they were completely offended and the reason why it was because this particular author was on the spectrum and the way this editor had gone about giving feedback was not a way that the author was able to easily receive it mm -hmm. and so being able to even try to nip some of those scenarios in the bud ahead of time is is very helpful for in so much as as uh as authors are willing to share i think that helps um a lot to try to you know head some head some of these issues off before they might even come up yeah um, nice yeah, I, th I think they, that Alicia and Kimmy have covered it uh, pretty much. But, you know, it's about, it comes back to, it's editing is about personal relationships. You have to figure out where you, where the author is comfortable and how far you can go and how to handle it. Every relationship is different. But I'm also going to say to you that, yes, there's ki kindness, but as authors, you have to be open-minded and embrace the process. Um, I am, I'm your editor, not your head cheerleader. And I, I think that's, so through all of that kindness, I also have to be very firm with you and say, this is not working. Of course, I have to respect your decision at the end, but I have to be, it's that honesty that Kimmy was talking about is that, yeah, I've got to tell you, if I see problems, then then we've got to got to do it. Uh, we've got to address them. We've got to talk about them. If you're mm -hmm. dealing with material that is uh, culturally sensitive and you're going about it in a way that could cause offense, you have to say, listen, you are, here you are. Um, this is a problem. What the author does with it, it's up to them, but you have to point it out. So yes, I can do that kindly, but I still have to be very firm about doing that and doing it. I'm not your cheerleader. And having been on the receiving end of you need to write this entire novel from scratch from a different point of view, according to Peter Mitchley, <laughs> I can guarantee you it's a lot of work, but it works. He says, this isn't working. It, the, the whole novel is wrong. Start again. And then you, you, you um, mentally push him off the cliff and then you pull him back before he drops because you need him. <laughs> I see a lot of, um, <laughs> I, I see a lot of trust and trust building that needs to happen then in general, yeah. right? So, so editing as trust. So how to deal with defensive authors, it is about building that relationship. It is about building the trust and and then listening to where, where it is. And if you see the signs of discomfort, step back and try to find out why it is. These have been great conversations and reflections on all these topics from the most practical to the naming of the types of edits to the more abstract things such as the stead walk and our well-being mm -hmm. that are so important too. Um, and I really want to thank you, the three of you for, for having been with us in our last 101 panel. Um, before we close, I would like to redirect also your attention to our upcoming conference when worlds collide. Um, so stay posted, keep, uh, keep you, we'll keep you posted in our website. And I know that Ellen Cars is working really hard for the publicity of those events. So um, just keep your eyes peeled for the early bird special for the conference to sign up and for the keynotes and workshops and panels. And uh, may we continue conversations like this one on editing and friendships and trust and, and all those good things that literature brings to us in this province also thanks to the WGA and the Edmonton Arts Council. So from me, thank you to all of you. Thank you. Anna, thank you so much. And thank you, Alicia and Peter. This has been such a good time. Oh it's, my goodness. It's always a delight to be in your company. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> I feel that this has been a fever dream. I can't believe that my name is alongside Peter Midgley and Kimmy B. So honestly, I'm I'm good. This is great. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you and all. Thank you all Luciana. for everybody. Oh thank you and all. Thank you. thank you all. Thank you, Luciana.
Yeah. Take we, care. We, much thanks. Thank, Thank you. Appreciate. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, okay. Jason. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Good Bye. night.